the Diels Alder reaction is um, a very interesting reaction um, in the sense that you form uh, rings, mostly six membered rings. So uh, they're often used in things like steroid synthesis, for example. Uh, the reaction's mechanism is pretty straightforward. If you look down below, there's two parts. There's a diene, so that's the compound that contains two alkenes. It has four electrons along with it. And then there's something called the dienophile. So remember, file means love. It loves the diene. And it has just one double bond, and it typically has this W group on it. And W means it's an electron withdrawing group. It simply makes this reaction go faster. So we'll see that it pops up as we get going into like real examples and stuff. Electron flow follows what I've written here. So we're coming over, making a bond to this carbon. This is swinging over to this position, and then we're making a bond to that carbon there. Okay. So in the done, when we're done here, what we're looking at is a double bond that's moved position, and then also two new sigma bonds being formed. Now I want to point out something. This is a, a straightforward looking reaction, but this right here, this here, that carbon and that carbon, put a little asterisk over here. Th these are all potential stereocenters. So that's something that we're going to have to consider as we go through and look at this reaction in more detail. Now, um, this reaction is also classically known as a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. So that's because you're adding 4 electrons and 2 electrons. When we're talking about those electrons, we're talking about the electrons of the alkene. Now, the mechanism of this is interesting. Um, even though it's one step, it's one of the reactions that we're going to see this semester that gets involved into looking at orbitals a little bit more. So I put this picture together here for you, and I want to show you exactly what's required for this reaction to occur. So it turns out that it's the p orbitals, right, on those pi bonds that need to overlap with the p orbitals of the pi bonds of the of the uh, of the diene. So you have the dienophile down here at the bottom, diene up here at the top. And it turns out specifically that it's the highest occupied molecular orbital of the diene that needs to overlap with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the dienophile. And we want to um, undergo constructive overlap. So when you look at it like this, you have this darkened in lobe matching up with this dark lobe here and this highlighted lobe here that's not shaded overlapping with the other orbital. So this is a is a is a below attack, right? It's not in the plane, so they're not hitting each other like square on. But also I wanted to point out to you here that if you took this and lifted it up here, that this bottom lobe and this bottom lobe would overlap with these two lobes. So because of that, we're always going to have to consider this above and below attack as we go through and carry out reactions, especially when those little asterisk carbons that are up above, when those things become stereocenters, that's going to be pretty critical for us to do. So let's start looking at some of the rules. So when we talk about this idea of stereochemistry, um, the first thing that that is pretty straightforward to understand is that the S cis conformation is required. Remember, S cis has the double bonds um, next to each other, right? So this is S cis, right? And remember, that is in equilibrium with S trans. So S cis is required. And that's required because the orbitals need to be close to each other to overlap, right? So here's your S cis. Right here. Here's your dienophile down here below. Here's our lobe interacting with this lobe. Okay. Here's the other lobe interacting with that. So they need to be close to each other. 
right? So when they're close to each other, they can touch. Here's our transition state. And then this would be our, your final product here, right? Okay. So if, if this is pushed away and it's back like that, right? so here's your carbon chain, right? Carbon, 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 back carbon. Here they're all together, right? So when they're pushed back like that, um, the orbital simply cannot overlap because the carbon-carbon double bond of the dienophile is not long enough to stretch, right? Like this part of it can't stretch and overlap with that part. It's just simply too far away. So that's a pretty easy one to remember. Remember that this occurs at room temperature. So sometimes in the textbook, they like to give you um, this as a reactant and your aunt, you, know, you might think, well, nothing happens. But remember that at room temperature, you can form this. Right? That's less stable anyway, so um, the S trans is going to predominate at equilibrium. But because um, it's in equilibrium and through Le Chatelier's, we can continuously supply the S cis for our Diels Alder reaction. Okay. Now, this final product over here, sometimes we call the adduct also. So that's our final product. In this case, it would simply be cyclohexene. Now, um, as you might expect, molecules that lock yourself in to being S cis are very reactive because S cis is the geometry required, right? So down here at the end, here we have cyclo pentadiene, sometimes we call the CPD. That's very reactive. In fact, it's so reactive that it reacts with itself to feel, form something called dicyclopentadiene. Right? And then on the other end of the spectrum, this does not allow for S cis because you're locked in S trans. So there's no Diels Alder for that molecule on the far left. Now, the second rule for this has to deal with the stereochemistry of substituents. So um, a couple things to consider. Um, the first kind of easy thing to look at is the stereochemistry of the dienophile. So notice here that the diene has no substituents other than H on it, right? So here you just have 1,3-butadiene reacting with the cis disubstituted dienophile. Now they're cis to begin with. So if they're cis to begin with, then it turns out in the end that the substituents are also cis to each other. Now in this case, that's the only product that you get because this is meso. If it wasn't, then you would also form the enantiomer of this. So down below, if cis gives you cis, then you might guess that trans gives you trans. So here your nitro groups are trans to each other. And then what I want you guys to do is to not write this plus an antimer in there. I would want you guys to write this thing out. So you'd write NO2 here and then NO2 down there. Um, and then the relationship there is that these are enantiomers to each other. Now there's a little trick with this too, um, and I'll show this to you down below. And that is this, is that um, when you have your dienophile, okay, the substituents that are cis to each other here will be cis and the final adduct. The substituents that are trans to each other will be trans to each other and the final product. Now, what about the, the diene? Well, the diene is going to complicate things a little bit. So it turns out that there still is a relationship that we can make here. We can say this. So if we're pointing kind of out and out here, right? So if we're talking about this, these are kind of coming out towards us, right? And these guys are pointing towards the inside, like two fingers pointing in towards each other. If you have an outer, outer, it's cis. If it's inner, inner, it's cis. And if it's a mixture of those, then it's trans. I uh, Your book goes into this. I never spent time trying to memorize this. Instead, 
I just kind of remembered um, what I'm going to show you next, and that is the relationship between this inner and outer and cis and trans of that dienophile when we do these additions. So let's take a look at this in more detail. So let me zoom in here. So I, if I were you guys, this is the thing that I would probably have commit to my memory. So what we're going to do is this, is we're going to start off here drawing our dyne out kind of like this, okay? Um, and then I'm going to draw my carbon up here just to make this clear, all right? Um, and remember, what we're trying to show is this, this overlap because it's sideways, right? So here's a P orbital, right? So on and so forth. I'm not going to leave them in there like that because it's just going to make the drawing look kind of complicated. Okay. Now, all right, pointing in and in here, I'm going to label this as just number one and number two. Okay, And then um, pointing out back here, I'm just going to make those H's for, for right now. All right. All right now, and, and let's look at this as approaching from the bottom. So down here below, here's another molecule. Here's your dienophile. Right now the dienophile has substituents on it too. So it's got this H that's pointing kind of out towards us. H kind of pointing out. And then going back here, we'll just make this um, A and then kind of back like this, we'll make that uh, B. All right, so perspective wise, what's happening is that this is actually kind of going back it's easier to show it here, and these H's are kind of coming forward at us. So it's easier to, to use the wedges and dashes here than it is on that structure up above. Now remember what has to happen here is that these carbons, their orbitals are going to overlap with each other. So they're going to come over and they're going to touch each other, and the reaction will take place. So when they do that, we're going to see a, a kind of a movement in the skeleton. So what I want to do next is I want to draw this molecule out in kind of like this little boat conformation. Okay, so all we're doing is we're making a connection. So these carbons that I'm circling right now are these bulleted carbons right here. All right, and then um, the carbons that are down here I'll just make these square. They're these carbons that are right there. Okay. So that that keeps track of where our carbons are going to be. And the double bond's going to be here. Okay. Now, number one and number two, when we approach from the bottom, are going to be pushed up. So there's number one, there's number two. So this is number one up here. That's number two right there. So if those are up, then the other atoms must be below. Right? So then as our dienophile approaches from the bottom, our A and B are going to end up getting pushed down. So B was here, and then A is over there. And what we're left pointing up here are the H atoms. Now we don't usually leave the structure like this because it's just kind of an unorthodox way of leaving it, but uh, you could if you wanted to. But if we took this molecule and we rotated it around kind of towards us, so imagine you're picking it up and turning it towards you. You would have your double bond here, and as you turned it towards you, number one and number two would be facing at you. Right. And then A and B would be pointing away from you. So there's your A and there's your B. Now, when we look at this molecule, we'd say, okay, well, that, that's a chiral molecule um, as long as 1 and 2 are different and A and B are different. So that's going to be one of the enantiomers, and the other one would form. So once we're done with this next little explanation, 
what you probably would do is you probably just would take that structure and draw the enantiomer of it. I want to show you how it's formed though. So this is just an exercise for, for us. We don't have to do this for every one of these. Okay, So we're going to go through. We're going to put our double bonds in here. Right? And then we're going to have our H and our H here. And then our 1 and our 2 pointing in just like before. So there's your 1 and then your 2. And then so then approaching from above, we're going to have up here your carbon, double bonded to a carbon. You're going to have your A and your B and your H's here. So we said those were H's before. And then I think we said this was A, and then this is B. Okay. So now as we approach here from, from the top, the same thing's going to happen here. So my alignment's a little bit harder to see, but that carbon here is going to come over and, and hang out with this carbon. And the one that's over here is going to come over and make a bond with that. Right. So they're not lined up perfectly, but I think you can get an idea of what's happening there. And then what we're going to form is this. So we're going to get our, our double bond in here. But instead of going down, we're going to come up. So there's going to be a bend that's up like this. Right? Double bond goes here. Right, so this comes up, down, kind of like that. right? And here's like, that's the fold in the chair, so to speak. Right? Now, as we came from the bottom on that example up above, one and two got pushed up. So now what happens is we come down, one and two go down. So A and B went down on our top example, but A and B are going to point up on this example. So A is opposite and B is here. And then the H's are just going to be below. In this case, and above, in that case. Okay. All right. Now we're going to take this molecule and we're going to rotate it towards ourselves. And as we do that, our number one is going to be on a dash, and our number two is on a, on a dash. So here's my one. There's my two. And then. Um, a and B will be pointing at us. So here's your A, and then here's your B. Right, so then if we look at these structures, and pull this thing out, right? if we look at them now, you can see here, hopefully, that those two guys are enantiomers of each other. Okay. So as a student, I used to just kind of remember this. And then if the molecule turned out to be chiral, I would just change the relative configuration at those positions. Right, now there's some more rules and some examples that I want to go through, but I'm going to do that in another video.